Hey folks, welcome to a brief overview of Chapter 18, The Progressive Era from 1900 to 1916 from Eric Foner's Give Me Liberty, the third edition. My apologies for my voice not sounding so great, but I've been battling a cold and hopefully my voice will get through this. So let's get to it. Um, first, take a look at these photos here. On the left, you have a boy, uh, maybe middle school age, maybe early high school, uh, possibly late elementary school, who's been working in the coal mines. And you can see the effect that that, it ha that has had on him. And child labor was an issue that would be dealt with during the Progressive Era. On the right, you have a political cartoon uh, that presents a point of view on the women's suffrage movement. Um, so based on this, what, do you think it's advocating for women's suffrage? Or do you think it is against it? So first thing we need to talk about is urbanization and consumerism. Urbanization is talking about the growth of cities and consumerism is talking about the growth of uh, mass consumption, people buying a lot of stuff, maybe stuff they don't need, but that they want. But this time period saw cities and Western populations grow very rapidly, cities especially. Western populations weren't growing as quickly um, but there was an increase in the demand for farm goods, and so there had to be people out west uh, to actually make those goods and send them to the cities for people to eat. <clears throat> 21 cities, in fact, had populations over 100,000, which is really big. Uh, poverty and wealth also were side by side in adjacent neighborhoods. We still see the same kind of things here in Aurora and in Denver, where you could have a really rich neighborhood right next to a neighborhood that has sees very low income or seems very poor. Uh, and it was the same back then, where you had some of the wealthiest Americans living uh, next to neighborhoods that saw some of the, the, the poorest of the poor. Meanwhile, out west, between 1900 and 1910, there were one million claims for land filed under the Homestead Act. So the Homestead Act was still very much in effect during this time. Uh, and with extra money and more goods being produced, you have this era of mass consumption begin. Uh, which we're very familiar with today, people having extra money and buying stuff that, again, they don't really need, but that they would want. Uh, this is also an era that saw a lot of new leisure activities, things for people to do for fun and to spend their money on, like going to amusement parks, vaudeville shows, which would be like stand-up comedians of the era, sketches, musical numbers. Uh, also, movies or Nickelodeons were available for the first time, very short films that you would pay a nickel to watch. Um, also, watching sports for fun became a popular pastime, uh, actually paying to go see baseball games or to go see cycling games or to go see tennis and things like that became uh, popular. And this was a new understanding of economic freedom, that when you had money, you could go out and spend it and have choices about what you wanted to do with your money. And the production in the United States begins to shift from capital goods, which are goods that are used to make other goods or for businesses to use to consumer goods, goods for people to just buy and use for their own pleasure and enjoyment. And we're also gonna see an increase in advertising. Companies like Macy's here on the left, this is Macy's in New York City, just after it originally opened. This is the same Macy's that hosts the Thanksgiving Day Parade. And Macy's and other companies are gonna really put an emphasis on advertising to get consumers to buy their goods. And the standard of living is going to go up with all this mass production and increase in income, but the standard of living is going to be more difficult to attain as prices uh, go up. <clears throat> Another thing that had a major impact on this time period, especially in cities, was new immigration. Now, we've always had immigrants come to the United States. The reason we call this new immigration is there was a massive shift in the numbers and also where people were coming from. Between 1900 and 1914, we had 13 million immigrants enter the United States. Uh, and with these immigrants, uh, but from 1900 to 1930, 1 million of them uh, were Mexicans. Uh, and that is 10% of Mexico's population at the time. That is a huge number uh, coming to the United States. By 1910, one seventh of the total US population was foreign born, were immigrants who came to the United States. Why were these Folks coming in such large numbers, well, multiple reasons. They were escaping poverty in their home countries. They were escaping uh, heavy taxation. They were escaping war. Uh, Mexico, for instance, was in the midst of a violent civil war in, uh, in the first couple of years of the 1900s, and so people fled to the United States to escape that. Um, they were escaping political and religious persecution, uh, especially 
uh, Jews in Europe were fleeing to the United States because they were being persecuted. Uh, and you should note, this is well before World War II. Persecution of Jews was not something that just started in World War II. It happened uh, frequently, uh, especially in European uh, and Asian history. Uh, and many of them, especially young men, were escaping a military draft because of conflicts that were happening. They didn't want to fight in wars that they didn't uh, really get anything out of or support. And they would enter through places like Ellis and Angel Island. Um, these were places, Ellis is in New York's, uh, New York City Harbor. You can go and visit it today. Angel Island is just outside of San Francisco. Both places still exist. They're museums. If you ever have a chance to go visit them, you should because they are incredible and give you a lot of insight into uh, what it was like to come into the United States as an immigrant during this time period. And a lot of these immigrants were drawn to cities and to specific neighborhoods because these neighborhoods uh, would become ethnic enclaves, cultural enclaves, where people from Russia could come and hear other uh, and hear people speaking Russian, people from Estonia, people from uh, Nigeria, people from Japan, people from China could go to these neighborhoods and see people who looked like them, who spoke the same language, who had the same dreams, uh, and could provide support networks as well in their new homeland. On the left, by the way, you see this photo of the young boys. They're going through a very quick uh, medical inspection before being let into the United States. And the photos at the bottom are photos of immigrants who are coming into the United States. Meanwhile, when it came to women, uh, this was the introduction of something that was dubbed the new feminism. And here we have a photo of women, women suffragists, women wanting women, women in support of women getting the right to vote throughout the United States. And part of the reason for this resurgence or increase, actually, in support for women's rights, especially uh, voting, was that the number of college-educated women and women working for wages and married women who are working drastically rises. Um, <clears throat> and with this rise of college-educated women and women working, they, there's this idea of this, or this desire for new independence that is challenging the gender norms of the day, the idea that women should be subservient to men. And so this is the beginning of what we would call today feminism. Uh, there's more talk about women being involved in politics. There's more talk about women in sexuality and sexuality in general. Uh, there's more talk about things like birth control, uh, which obviously uh, heavily affects women. And you had women like Margaret Sanger and Emma Goldman who spoke out about all of these things, very controversial figures in their day and still controversial today uh, because of their ideas from back then. You had others who would focus on maternalist ideas, this idea of women's in their role as mothers, and they should be more assertive in society with their roles, with their what were considered their natural roles as mothers. Uh, and they, in this idea, were taking on, uh, taking on things like child labor, working conditions, sanitation, better housing uh, for people. These were ideas that were seen as, as uh, things that mothers dealt with naturally, so why not focus on them for the whole of society? One exemplifier of this was Jane Addams. Uh, she started something that was known as a settlement house called Whole House in Chicago in 1889. And this was a organization uh, that worked to combat these things, to, to improve the living conditions of immigrants and poor people living in the cities. Uh, and eventually these settlement houses um, spread out throughout the country. Uh, there were over 400 in cities throughout the United States. And these settlement houses and these programs provided opportunities for college educated women to actually use their skills that otherwise they were not able to put to use because of discrimination in the workplaces. Women's suffrage also saw a huge surge. In 1917, you had more than 2 million members of the NAWSA, one of the leading women's suffragist groups. <clears throat> Excuse me. And women were gaining the right to vote in more states. This was kind of a westward movement. Wyoming was the first territory to grant women the right to vote, uh, and it was quickly followed by uh, states like Colorado uh, and Utah. And the these states were giving women the right to vote in local and state elections, and eventually it's going to uh, impact the whole United States. We're not quite there yet. Meanwhile, let's take a look at industry and how the Progressive Era affected industry. Here we have a photo of two men working on an assembly line, assembling a car most likely a Model T car, or at least a Ford in Ford's factory in Michigan. And this is a time period that's going to see production increase while worker autonomy or independence is going to decrease. 
You had ideas, these ideas like scientific management that actually made work more efficient, but it made work more repetitive. You could do the same job and do it very well, but you would be doing that same job day in and day out, and it never really changed. And that kind of repetition could drive people nuts. Uh, There's also the idea of Fordism, named after Henry Ford, who was the founder of Ford Motor Company. Um, and Ford, as is shown in the photo on the left, used assembly lines and also paid his workers high wages for of the day to create mass production and mass consumption. So now his workers, like those on the left, could produce a lot of cars. And also because they got high wages, they could go out and actually buy these cars and buy other goods. Um, there's also an increase in management in this time, or white collar positions. Uh, so bosses, managers who are overseeing the, uh, the, the blue collar workers. They were called white collar workers because they could wear a white collar and not worry about it getting as dirty. If you were a blue collar worker, you wore a blue collar because you wanted to hide the grime that built up as you sweat. Progressive generally supported the empowerment of workers uh, and also encouraged more power through unions. And speaking of unions, let's talk about labor and socialism during this time period. This cartoon here on the left is, uh, is it's supportive of a group that we're going to get to in just a bit, the International Workers of the World, the IWW, the Wobblies. But this was a time period where socialism really emerged as a force to be reckoned with in the United States and especially in Europe. Uh, and this combined populists or the People's Party with other labor and utopian movements, as well as immigrant labor. Remember, we had a lot of immigrants coming to the United States from Europe who brought ideas or at least familiarity with socialism to the United States. What they wanted? Well, they wanted things like free college education. They wanted government regulation of working conditions and railroads and corporations. They believed that corporations and railroads especially were becoming too powerful and taking away the rights of workers. <clears throat> and they would actually see success uh, mostly at the local and state elections, where they would have hundreds of local and state uh, officials who were elected uh, promoting socialism. One of the most well-known, Eugene V. Debs, who you may be familiar with. He was very involved in some strikes in the 1890s. He was frequently a presidential candidate for the Socialist Party. In fact, in 1912, he would gain 6% of the vote. That's 900,000 votes. And remember, that's in an election where only men could vote for the president. So that is an impressive percentage. He even ran for president while he was in prison, uh, and he was in prison several times. So the union I mentioned earlier, which the cartoon talks about on the left, are the International Workers of the World, or the IWW, or as they were nicknamed, the Wobblies. Uh, and they were a outspoken socialist union. Uh, they wanted to organize all workers of the world, not just the United States. And they were led by a big, larger-than-life guy named William Big Bill Haywood, very controversial figure, but also very... Uh, assertive in his desire to unite the whole world. Uh, you also had the American Federation of Labor, which I've mentioned before. Uh, they grew a lot during this time under the leadership of Samuel Gompers. In fact, they tripled their membership to 1.6 million between the years 1900 and 1904. However, they focused on collective bargaining instead of direct action. The Wobblies, the international workers of the world, uh, would use things like direct action, going on strikes, uh, being very forceful and getting what they wanted. The American Federation of Labor focused more on negotiations and collective bargaining, having a team uh, speak for all of their members to try and get better working conditions and better pay and things like that. And there is an increase in strikes during the era. In fact, we'll look at one, uh, the, the Ludlow Massacre, which took place in Colorado, just south of here, uh, just outside of Pueblo. Um, and we'll take a look at that in class. <clears throat> and there was also the Bread and Roses, which some of you uh, already researched when you were looking at labor strikes. Meanwhile, when it came to politics, uh, there's a massive change in politics of the era, led in part by the guy who's mentioned in this cartoon here, Robert La Follette, who's uh, in Wisconsin. Um, so progressives wanted government to combat the power of corporations, to protect consumers, and to regulate the workplace. Many of the same things that uh, the, that progressives wanted in the workplace uh, were reflected in the politics. And they gained a lot of support from groups known as muckrakers. And these were journalists who exposed corruption and called for reforms in the workplace and reforms in government. Some of the most well-known, Ida B. Wells, who protested lynching, Ida Tarbell, uh, 
who spoke out against uh, Standard Oil, uh, Jacob Reese and Lewis Hind, who exposed living and working conditions, Lincoln Steffens, who exposed corruption in government and state and local government, and Upton Sinclair, who exposed corruption in industry, uh, especially the meatpacking industry. And we'll take a look at some of their work as well, because even today it's fascinating to look at and an inspiration for a lot of journalists today. And most reforms happened at the state and local level. Uh, such things as funding public schools, uh, control of public utilities like water, uh, gas, and electricity, uh, where a lot of that took place during this time. Uh, there were pushes to reduce the power of political bosses in choosing leaders. Things like initiatives and referendums and primaries empowered voters to actually vote for legislation uh, and also choose the candidates that they wanted to vote for in offices. This also was a time period that saw a constitutional amendment that allowed for the direct election of senators in the 17th Amendment. Remember, originally senators uh, were chosen by state legislatures, uh, and that could lead to corruption and bribery and taking away people's voices. Um, there's also an increase of influence of experts, college professors and, and researchers in local and state management. Uh, and the idea was to make local and state government more efficient and more effective and do what was best based on data, based on research. Um, and part of this was inspired by the Wisconsin idea, which is what the cartoon on the left uh, is portraying. Uh, and Robert M. La Follette was the governor of Wisconsin who promoted a lot of these ideas and these reforms. And he would eventually run for president as well, uh, but not win. But his ideas did spread uh, throughout the country. One downside of these ideas, especially giving experts so much influence, is it could take away power from the people uh, and could also lead to voting restrictions. This idea that only the most qualified and knowledgeable people should vote. Um, that idea helped support things like poll taxes and discriminatory uh, voting laws that prevented most of the time uh, African Americans and other minorities, racial minorities from voting, but also could lead to restrictions on people who uh, were poor uh, or illiterate from having their voice heard. Finally, uh, let's take a look at the presidents and progressivism. This was a time period that saw some very powerful and influential presidents. During the Gilded Age, presidents really didn't demonstrate too much power, but that was quickly going to change uh, with the beginning of the 1900s. Um, the era saw growth in presidential power and the use of that power to enact progressive reforms. And really, they changed the way we view the presidency today and how the presidency uh, impacts the United States. Uh, this begins in part with Theodore Roosevelt, who's in the top right corner here. What he called the square deal. Uh, this was basically the three C's, conservation or saving of natural resources, control of corporations, uh, making sure corporations did not abuse their power, and consumer protection, making sure that people were getting good products and not being lied to. Um, Roosevelt sided with unions uh, at times. He strengthened the International Commerce Commission, which regulated railroads. He signed laws like the Pure Food and Drug Act and signed laws uh, or bills that were promoting conservation of wild lands. This was a time period when a lot of national parks uh, and wilderness were uh, assigned. William Howard Taft, who followed him, uh, did, followed in Roosevelt's uh, footsteps in many ways. He broke up even more corporations antitrust through antitrust laws. He, uh, during his time period, he oversaw the ratification of the 16th Amendment, which introduced a progressive uh, income tax, uh, which affected people with <laughs> massive amounts of income, uh, make them pay more in taxes. And he signed bills to conserve even more lands. The election of 1912 uh, saw a four-way race and it was between these four men, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, Woodrow Wilson, and Eugene Debs on the right. He was the socialist candidate. Uh, Taft was the Republican candidate. And Roosevelt tried to get the Republican nomination, but he, when he didn't get it, he started his own political party, the Progressive Party, also nicknamed the Bull Moose Party. And then Woodrow Wilson was the Democratic nominee. And this four-way race was, was very close. And you had these four candidates who were basically running on progressive ideas. Woodrow Wilson, though, would win out as the Democrat. Uh, and he won with a platform called New Freedom, uh, where he supported stronger antitrust laws and rights for workers to unionize and to empower small businesses. Uh, Roosevelt would run on something called the New Nationalism, 
uh, and which promoted very similar ideas, um, but also very important, but different in several key ways. And Taft and Debs, this was the election that Debs did pretty well. It got 900,000 votes, 6% of the vote. Um, so it was very interesting to have presidents whose platforms were were similar in a lot of ways, different in key ways, but also very similar. And they could all agree that the power of the presidency could be used to radically overhaul the United States. We'll, folk, we'll look at some of these things in class, uh, <clears throat> but thanks for listening. Thanks for putting up with my cold. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll see you back here for chapter 19, where the United States is going to be getting into World War One.